Okay, so welcome to the bite-sized talks. There are a lot of people still wanting to come in, so if you have a seat available next to you, please raise your hand. And if, you're not, if you don't have a problem with persons sitting next to you, of course. <laughs> yeah, put it down. No, please raise your hand if you want some, uh, someone ne sitting next to you. There are quite a few seats left, but they're a bit scattered over the, over the room, so. Follow the hands that are in the air. And if you can't manage to find a seat, I hope the stairs are fairly comfortable. <laughs> in the meantime, I'll get started because I only get 16 minutes. So my name is Hanno Embrechts, and um, I, I work as an IT consultant at InfoSupport in Veenendaal. And last summer, this summer, I um, um, got my Java 11 certification. And my employer asked me to do this. I had already had a Java 5.0, but it was obviously ancient. And my employer asked me to upgrade it because it was very useful in a bit that we were doing for a potential client. And I thought, well, I've been a Java developer for over 14 years. Surely, what could this new certification teach me? I know this stuff already and probably by heart. Boy, was I wrong. I studied quite hard for a few weeks, did some practice exams and I came up with a list of like 50 things that I didn't know by heart. So this either means I have been a very lousy developer for the past 14 years, or this means that there, these are just 50 things that you don't come across every day and I forgot about them or I never even learned them at all in the first place. And I picked 11 things from this list of 50 that I thought were a bit crazier than the other ones and I want to show them all to you today in 16 minutes, which means that you are going to learn 11 crazy things in 16 minutes that I took over 14 years to learn. So that's like 400,000 times faster than I did. Um, so buckle up because it's going to be fast and you're going to see quite a lot. Um, this is the structure of my talk. I just uh, created 11 test suites and most of them are failing right now but we want to make them succeed. So that's what we're going to do. And the first item is number 11, a few freaky ways to declare and initialize arrays. Now I have created a few arrays here and two test methods and they expect arrays of uh, int arrays of length two, right? But as you can see at the red icon, they're both failing. Why are they failing? Well, in this case, because it returns an empty object reference, not even an array. So let's remove this one and uncomment this one because I really want to be able to use var uh, in the from Java 11 local type uh, variable uh, inference, but you can't do it like this. Var is actually the generic type, and you have to, uh, at runtime, you have to pr provide the int array. So it doesn't work like this. You have to remove the brackets, and then it's okay. Secondly, I, I'm not sure if you folks are used to C style arrays, but in Java, you can also provide the array brackets after the variable name. And I've tried to do this, and I wanted to create two arrays like this. But if you create two arrays like this, this was also in a, a practice exam question. The second one isn't actually an int array. It is an int, because int, you know, that's the one that got, gets repeated. So it's a <laughs> yeah, that's a silly one. And um, I, th I think it's quickly overlooked. So this is what you have to do, and then it will work. So I have one attempt to fix all these tests. I will, I will rerun them as we go. So if one still is failing, I will check it out at the end, because I don't have time to, to return to it. Otherwise, the 16 minutes will be up very quickly. So I'll move on to number 10 and try to run the tests in the background. Number 10 is about stream elements. I have created a stream of talks. Here we go. And the talks are by famous speakers such as Bugs Bunny, Roadrunner, and Tweety. He talks about Ben all cats of the internet, for example. Um, and I want to create a sorted stream, so I call sorted. But this is also a very intricate detail that if you want to call sorted on a stream, then you get you can get this error message. It cannot be cast to comparable because sorted expects this stream class to be comparable. And I haven't implemented that interface. A very, very weird error message. But if you get it, you should remember that it should implement comparable. So I've got a talk class here with the speaker in the title, and I have to make sure that it implements comparable in the first place. Right? Comparable of talk. So here we go. And if we implement that interface, of course, we have to make sure to have an implementation for compare to. And let's just return, um, uh, let's sort by speaker, right? Uh, Speaker.compare to talk.speaker, which should fix the test. Moving on to number nine, accessing static interface methods. This one really blew my mind. So I've got the same talk uh, class here, but this time the talk class uh, implements uh, an interface uh, which is slot, like a conference slot on a schedule. And the slot interface contains 
an int which is um, implicitly a static, a public static int in this case, because all variables in interfaces are static. And there is a static method called length description, which just returns a, a specific string. This slot lasts for 50 minutes. 50 minutes, for example. Um, well, I can, I can uh, refer to this static variable, no problem, and we can assert that it is equal to 50. But what if I would want to assert this length description, this static method? Turns out I can't. I can't get to this method by using the variable name. I can invoke it on the containing interface class only, which means I have to provide the actual interface name to be able to call this method. I never knew this, and I had to learn it for the exam. So now I know, and you do too. Moving on to number eight, creating anonymous subclasses in an enum definition. Yes, you can. I had no idea. We're having some test methods, and we're just asserting when the next few conferences are taking place. So hopefully the next DevOps in Antwerp will be in 2022. It will take place in Belgium. Uh, Oracle Code 1 2022 will take place in the USA. And of course, JFOL, this is the next JFOL, the current JFOL. Um, it is the best one-day conference we know. So when I um, um, call this method on the JFOL enum, I want this message to be a bit longer. Well, let's jump to the enum definition. So here it is. The three conferences with the name and the next edition years and the countries. And if I want, uh, when is the next method to return something else for JFOL, I can just override the method right here. Bizarre stuff. So when I, when I saw this in one of the exam questions, I lost my mind. But it is actually possible to just concatenate a new string here and uh, save it and um, run the test again which is what I'm doing in the background. Division by zero causes an arithmetic exception, right? I thought it caused, caused arithmetic exceptions all the time. I've created a divide method, well, three variants of it actually, one with an int, one with a float, and one with a double. And my, um, my assertions here expect to raise this arithmetic exception with a certain message. And the first one succeeds, you can see by the green icon, but the other two are failing. Well, this is because, and I never knew this, but the float and the double class actually have um, constants that are equal to infinity. So if you divide by zero for a float, you don't get an arithmetic exception, you get uh, infinity. And uh, it, that's actually, oh, this is the wrong one. That is actually a constant in the float class. So we can, for example, assert that it is equal to float dot float dot positive infinity. I never knew this. And I'm not sure when you would use this, but this is how it works. <laughs> uh, it's the same thing for double, by the way, so for double. Yeah, so number six, method overloading prioritors. They are all over the place. Well, they are actually quite defined, but I can't remember them. So um, I've created three test methods here, and uh, one of them is succeeding, and the other two are failing. And I'll show you why. So I've got a print sum method here. Let's give it some more space. Print sum method here with integer wrapper objects with double primitives and with an int var args um, parameter. And if I call this with int literals, what do you think will happen? Wh which one will be called? I was kind of guessing the integer boxed one. Uh, but of course it's not. <laughs> Of course it's not, it's the double one actually. So the priority is like this, widening a uh, data type is preferred over boxing. And boxing is in, in turn preferred over a var arcs parameter. Yeah, you just have to rem remember this stuff to, uh, to know it by heart. Um, and now I remember because I had to study for the exam. Uh, let's return to our test results because I just run, ran a main method and I want to return to, the oh, it doesn't show me it. One, one moment. We'll get there. So that was number six. Number five, the crazy stuff that is allowed in switch statements. This is really bizarre stuff. So I, I added ratings to our talk class, right? And um, uh, people can rate uh, the talks. I think it's with stars in the JFL app. Um, I used a character, because why not? So <laughs> you can rate A, B, C, D, E, or F, or even lower if you want. Uh, surely, I hope not for the speakers. Um, but um, rating A should result in a description grade talk. B should result in good talk. C or D should result in average talk. If we look at the test results right here, it seems that there's something fishy going on with C and D, because they don't return average talk. They return bad talk. And I thought, why is that? Because it looked fine to me. 
uh, until I saw this one. This is not this is not or. This is a bitwise operator. So what happens? This happens. C is actually equal to 99 in integer terms, uh, which is uh, equal to this binary representation. And the and the and the or bitwise operator well returns one if zero of there's a one inside of there. So this is the result. So actually this is case G instead of case C or D. Uh, the stuff that they that they come up with in the exam questions. Just bizarre. So this is actually the correct implementation, of course. Oh, not this. Not this. Yeah. Just use the, uh, the fall-through, and then it will work. Uh, I saw, by the way, that number six wasn't already. Uh, this number six is just a quest uh, qu uh, question of deleting uh, the assertions that are not the right <laughs> ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't do it this in uh, at your at your uh, at your project, right? Just for conference talks. <laughs> <laughs> Equality when dealing with cloned arrays. Number four. I have created an array of talks. They are talks by my uh, by my colleagues uh, Martin and Tom. Martin's talk was already uh, this morning, but it was a great talk. So go check it out on YouTube. The one by Tom Coles is still uh, you can still visit at 1655. Um, but for this uh, example, it's of course not ba about the talk content, but about these methods. There's a getter that just returns a talk array, and there's a cloned talk that returns the clone. And I thought, first time I, I ran this test, uh, I'll probably get the same instance. Well, of course, that's not true, because a cloned array is a new object on the heap, so how could the double equal operator return true? It will return false, of course. But then will it also mean that um, uh, it doesn't contain the actual elements? Well, let's see if that's the case. I thought if it's not the same, then of course the contained elements will also not be the same, but of course that's not true at all. It's a shallow clone, so just the array object is different, but the actual objects inside the error are the same. So I need to revert it to uh, the previous um, assertion like this. Number three, and we're getting there, wrapper objects, some are more equal than others. <laughs> Integer equals is a method that just does the double equals um, uh, operation. So very simple. Uh, just for sanity, I provided it with two different int literals, and they shouldn't be equal, and there's a green icon, so they are not equal. So sanity still remains. Uh, what happens when you uh, provide the same literal? They are also false because of boxing. Box integers, different objects on the heap, so they are false. They are not exactly the same object instance. However, and I lost it right here, if you provide the literals 10, then they are not false, they are true. So they are equal to each other by the double equals operator. And this is because Java does some reusing the wrapper object, just like string interning for a bit. So all short and integer values from these two boundaries will be cached, so they, they will reuse the same instances. Bizarre stuff. How can you even succeed this exam with questions like this, right? <laughs> this is just not possible. Uh, and if you really would want to bypass this, you can Always use the in new integer uh, uh, constructor to wrap it around another boxed object, then um, they will be unequal again, so like this. But it's deprecated, so don't use it. <laughs> yeah. um, moving on to number two, functional interfaces. I always, I always uh, learned that it can uh, just contain one abstract method. Well, it, that's not true. It can contain multiple. What's this? Um, so I've created a few functional interfaces. And just for sanity, can a functional interface also be an abstract class with one abstract method? Well, no, it can't. It has to be an actual interface. Uh, so like this one, for example. So this is a valid one. Also, when there's a default method, it's still a valid one because the print method is the abstract one. This is the default one. doesn't count towards the abstract uh, limit. What if you would create an interface that extends the other one that also has an abstract method? Well, it wouldn't compile because there are multiple abstract methods. So this is not a functional interface. However, if you would override the same one but provide a default implementation for the overridden one, then it becomes a functional interface again because there's only one abstract method. And here's the real, this turned me upside down and inside out, I kid you not. This is a functional interface because there is only one abstract method, the, the method book, and there are multiple other abstract methods, but they have been overridden from objects. And they don't count towards the functional interface, so you can actually use this. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> number one, 
passing arguments to method references. Now, a colleague told me that he knew this all along, but I had never heard about this, so I put it number one. But if you have used this in your production code, um, I, I stand corrected. Um, but still, uh, we're creating venues here, and it's quite a, uh, it's a standard immutable class, final fields, and I've got a few varieties of constructor, a default one, which just provides some default name for this venue and a default capacity, which is zero, so not very useful. But hey, it's a default value. You can provide the capacity by its own, you can provide the name by its own, or both of them. And then you get a, a field venue um, uh, instance. Um, this test method uses the constructor only, and then it uses a few assertions that I prepared before for various uh, configurations of this venue. So an anonymous one, a tiny classroom, a large anonymous value, a venue, and a regular classroom. Uh, all very straightforward, and all the assertions actually succeed. Uh, in this test method, I use lambda expressions, which all work out fine. But IntelliJ already told, tells me here, you can replace it with a method reference. Well, that's great, so let's do it. Using method references, and this is the one that actually fails, because, um, sure, the first one will, will be fine, just, just refer to this constructor reference, but what do I do here? How do I provide this parameter to the method reference? Well, you can't, right? doesn't compile. So I learned during studying for the exam that this is actually the constructor reference of the constructor that does not take any argument. But you can also create a constructor reference of a constructor that takes a string argument. You, you just don't need the supplier functional interface, you need the function interface. And you have to provide, uh, yes, a string. And it's not called get, of course, it's called apply, oh, double P. And you can uh, put a value here. Really nice, I never knew this. Uh, same, of course, with an integer. Not a problem, just provide integer here. And call apply with 200, for example. And finally, can we also call the constructor with two arguments? Well, we can, but we don't need a function. We need a by function, very good. <laughs> Which takes a string and an integer. And it's called apply. And we provide it with classroom and 30. Final run of all the tests, moment of truth. Oh, it's not 30, it should be 200. Or is it 30? No, it should be, oh, it should be 30. Yeah, there we have it, all tests fixed. These are 11 crazy things that I learned while studying for my, my exam. So if you want to get the certification, I can assure you that you will learn some things and um, you'll be better be because of it. Thanks for your attention.